Hello fellow true crimers, guess who is back with another solved true crime murder case. Today's case is one of the most horrendous and incomprehensible true crime cases I to this day have ever read and researched about. Not only is it horrendous, but it also does have a special place in my heart because this is the case that really started my true crime obsession. I remember reading about this case when I was about 12 or 13 years old and this is probably the wrong word to use, but I became so fascinated with this story. You will notice I have extremely strong opinions about this case and about the disgusting individuals that caused this young girl's death. This case made me start asking myself the big questions. The main one being, how could anyone, regardless of gender or age or whatever else, be capable of torturing, assaulting, and ultimately killing an innocent child? Shanda's case haunts me in so many ways and now is the time for me to cover her case and share her story now that I'm really starting to get comfortable with making these videos. This case has so much information available that this is definitely going to be a two-parter and for the sake of preventing confusion, I will be referring everyone in the story by name instead of initials, even though you all know repeating these murderers' names leaves a bitter and nasty taste in my mouth. But we have way too many people involved in this story, so I'm going to do what I have to do in order to cover this case as appropriately and as clearly as I possibly can. As always, I will now show my disclaimer. Today we'll be focusing on the background and all of the events leading up to a 12-year-old's murder. I will be talking about horrific topics, including physical assault and sexual abuse in this video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already, but enough small talk. Let's get into today's case. This is the events that took place before the murder of Shanda Scherer. To put things into perspective, let's go back all the way to the beginning of Shanda's life. Shanda Renee Scherer was born in Pineville, Kentucky on June 6, 1979 to her parents Stephen and Jacqueline, aka Jackie. Shanda would be Stephen Scherer's only child while her mother Jackie did already have one daughter, Shanda's older half-sister Paige with her high school sweetheart and first husband who she had shortly divorced after the birth of Paige. Unfortunately, the relationship between Stephen and Jackie also came to an abrupt end and the pair had gotten a divorce in 1982 when Shanda was about three years old. After Stephen and Jackie separated, Jackie took her daughters, Shanda and Paige, and relocated to Louisville, Kentucky, where she would meet and marry her third husband, a man named Ronnie Ott. So by this time, Jackie, Paige, and Shanda had moved around quite a bit, and Shanda was still very young. At this point, she was about seven years old when her mother married her stepfather. And despite moving around, changing schools every so often, Shanda Scherer blossomed wherever she went. Jackie described her daughter Shanda as a complete and total social butterfly. She was able to blend in anywhere she went and made friends as easily as it was for her to tie her own shoes. Shanda was sweet, kind, and hated to see anyone upset, especially if they were upset with her. She was very sensitive in that area. She never wanted to hurt anyone's feelings. Shanda was the definition of a gentle soul. She was bubbly, outgoing, and on top of that, she was strikingly beautiful. And this only becomes more apparent as she gets older. Jackie's new marriage gave her and her daughters the financial stability that Jackie had been looking for. Since becoming a teenage mother, once she had given birth to Paige, she struggled a lot financially and often had to work two jobs to make ends meet. But now, with Ronnie in her life, she didn't have to struggle anymore. He had a very well-paying job and offered his large home to all three of the girls, way before him and Jackie were even officially married. Overall, Ronnie was great with the girls. He treated them like his own. Paige and Shanda adored him as their stepfather. He made sure that they had everything they needed. And now with this new stability, Shanda began to thrive even more. Once they moved to Louisville, Shanda started attending St. Paul Catholic School. During her time at this school, Shanda was very, very active to say the least. Teachers and her fellow students loved her. She was very popular and had many friends and admirers. She was on the cheerleading team, the softball team, the volleyball team, just a tremendous and dedicated athlete. Meanwhile, at her age, I barely stayed with a sport for more than a couple of months before I grew bored and gave it up. Shanda had been in gymnastics and in the Girl Scouts, and on top of all of these activities, Shanda excelled academically and loved to read. Shanda Shara was playful and friendly. She loved being in the spotlight, and many of those who knew her described her as being full of life and very fun to be around. It brings literal tears to my eyes when I think about what a bright future Shanda should have had. It's devastating and heartbreaking. Like I said before, it's not a secret that Shanda was absolutely gorgeous. As you can imagine, she was really popular with the boys in her grade. 
and she did have cute little innocent boyfriend relationships. The 1980s period always fascinated me with how much older everyone looked. I mean, this was the first picture I have ever seen of Shanda. My first impression when I looked at this photo for the first time was that she had to be at least 15 or 16 years old. But nope, she was just 12 years old. Sadly, the relationship between Jackie and Ronnie ended after four years of marriage, and once again, Jackie decided to move herself and Shanda to a new area. Jackie and Shanda moved to New Albany, Indiana in June of 1991. New Albany is about 10 minutes away from Louisville, Kentucky, just across the Ohio River. There are multiple reasons why she specifically chose New Albany. Probably the main reason was because Shanda's father, Stephen Scherer, lived in Jeffersonville, Indiana with his new wife and her two children. Jeffersonville was about seven miles away from the townhouse Jackie and Shanda lived at. Stephen adored his daughter, and it was very important to him, Shanda, and Jackie that he got to see and spend time with his daughter as often as he could. And now that they lived seven miles away from each other, they now were able to spend a lot more time together than before. Another big reason was that Shanda's older sister Paige, who is now 19 years old, lived right across the street from Jackie and Shanda's new home. Shanda and Paige were very close despite having an eight year age difference. Another reason Jackie had chosen New Albany was because it was considered to be a very safe place to live and houses were selling cheaper than they were in other surrounding areas like Louisville at the time. At 11 years old, everyone around Shanda could see what a beautiful and polite young woman Shanda was becoming. Both of her parents constantly received compliments about their daughter as she was able to get along with everyone, with kids, with adults. She was very good at fitting into any and every situation she found herself in. She has been described by multiple people how she almost had some sort of angelic glow about her, which is kind of ironic when you know what happens to her. The only negative thing anyone really had to say about Shanda was she could be overly sensitive, but everything else that was said about this girl was overwhelmingly positive. It's shameful that such an incredible young girl who could have been anything she wanted to be had her life ripped away by people who couldn't care less. As the summer of 1991 was coming to an end, another significant change for Shanda was approaching quickly. She was starting the new school year at a brand new school called Hazelwood Middle School. Hazelwood was a much larger school than Shanda had been used to. The schools she attended prior were smaller, had a lot less students enrolled than this new school. Both Shanda and her mother, Jackie, had fears about her starting this new big school. They had typical fears of how she was going to adjust in this new place. Behind this normal fear and anxiety, Shanda was also very excited about her new school, and she wanted to walk in on her first day and give out a great first impression. As any typical 12-year-old girl, she spent a good amount of time choosing the perfect first day of school outfit and applying her makeup as perfectly as she could. She was at that tender age where she extremely cared about her appearance. She wanted to look good. According to Jackie, with no surprise, Shanda came home from her first day at Hazelwood Middle School and just like with everything else, she excelled on her first day. She was beyond happy about her new school. She absolutely loved everything about it. She loved her teachers, she loved her classes. She told her mom that she even made a couple of new friends. Instantly, all of their fears evaporated from both Shanda and Jackie. It was a relief that Shanda was able to do what she had always been able to do and immediately fit in with the other students. Everything seemed to be going well for Shanda, but this is when Shanda would meet one of the key people in this case. In my opinion, this individual would be the one that sets up Shanda's murder in motion. Very early on in the school year, literally within the first couple of weeks after the school year started, Shanda was talking with one of her new friends she had made, and this girl was telling Shanda how she wanted to break up with her boyfriend, but she was too scared to do this herself. Let's remember, these are middle schoolers. So Shanda, in an effort to help out this new friend, told her that she would go ahead and break up with this boy for her. Shanda was a people pleaser. She liked to help and stand up for people. So to her, this was just a way to help out another friend. After class was finished, Shanda walked up to this boy at his locker and presented him with a ring that he had given to his girlfriend. And Shanda told this boy that his girlfriend, her friend, was breaking up with him and told him that she was giving back the ring he had given her. But this boy refused to take the ring from Shanda. And he told her to basically mind her own business and that if his girlfriend really wanted to break up with him, then she can tell him herself. He was yelling at Shanda, pushing her hand away from him that held this ring, and Shanda began to yell back at him and proceeded to shove the ring back, demanding him to take the ring and that his girlfriend was breaking up with him and that he needed to get over himself and accept this reality. 
No surprise as this argument between Shanda and this boy in the middle of the hallway was getting louder, the surrounding students began to form a circle around them to see what was going on. During the confrontation between Shanda and this boy, a female student came forward and told Shanda to back off and to not mess with her cousin. This 14-year-old student's name was Amanda Heverin. Amanda was a well-known face at Hazelwood Middle because at this time in the early 90s, she had a very distinguished look. She dressed in baggy clothes, sweatshirts, jeans, she wore baseball caps, and she kept her hair cut very short. And due to this, she was often mistaken as a boy, which she seemed to have taken pride in and would like it when people would mistake her as a boy. So now Amanda was attempting to intimidate Shanda, letting her know that if she messed with her cousin, she was gonna mess with her too. And Shanda didn't wanna fight, but she wasn't a pushover either. She attempted to maintain the peace, but then Amanda had pushed her up against the lockers and wrestled Shanda to the floor, and both girls began punching at each other. Amanda, who was older and bigger than Shanda, maintained the upper hand, hitting her until a teacher finally stepped in and broke the fight apart. Both girls were taken to the principal's office, and as a repercussion for the physical fight occurring on school grounds, both girls were given five days of in-school detention and would be in this classroom together with no one else for the next five days. Shanda was very upset that she had gotten into trouble and was given this detention. This was the first time she had ever gotten into any type of trouble at school and definitely was the first time she had ever been in a physical fight with someone. The school contacted Jackie about the altercation her daughter had with Amanda and she was beyond shocked that Shanda had been in this fight. Once Shanda came home, she explained to her mother what had happened and Jackie was more scared for her daughter than she was mad at her. But Shanda assured her mother that she wasn't going to get into any more fights and that she would make sure that she made things right with Amanda. For Amanda, on the other hand, this was nothing new for her. She had gotten to fights and had been sent to detention many times. Amanda is an open lesbian. She wasn't out to her parents yet during this time, even though her father straight up asked her one day if she was a lesbian. She denied it and, and in fact she told him that she had a boyfriend. But this was obviously far from the truth. Amanda, from my knowledge, was out at school. Everyone was aware of her sexuality. Amanda even had a 16-year-old girlfriend. Amanda's girlfriend would become the leader of the group of girls that would go on to murder Shanda, and her name is Melinda Loveless. Melinda was born on October 28th, 1975 in New Albany, Indiana. She is the youngest of three daughters to Marjorie and Larry Loveless. To get a better understanding of this case, I will go ahead and give the background for everyone involved in Shanda's murder as they enter the timeline of events. It's very important to give out as many details of a case as possible, and in this case, the background of these young girls may give at least some sort of clarity as to what could have possibly led these teenagers to commit such a heinous murder. I'm going to be very blunt. I have little to no empathy left for these girls. Almost all of them arguably had shitty lives and or upbringings, but in my opinion, that doesn't excuse what they did to Shanda at all. So many people come from horrible homes, and yet they do not go out, kidnap, and brutally murder another person. I am a human being with a huge amount of empathy for other people. And what these girls went through is awful. No child should ever go through the things that they went through. But after knowing the brutal details of what happened to Shanda on her last night of life, which I promise I will go over in great detail in the next video, I just do not have any empathy left for them anymore. And if that makes me an asshole, then so be it. I'm sure after watching part two, or if you are familiar with this case, then most of you will or already agree with me. But let's get back to Melinda's upbringing. Melinda's father, in simple terms, is a disgusting piece of shit of a human being. The amount of disturbing things I have read about this man, and there is an abundance of articles detailing his sickness, is enough to give any average person nightmares. He was drafted and he served in the Vietnam War, and when he returned, he was seen as a war hero which he's not a hero, you guys. He is the opposite of a hero. This man is pure evil. After coming home from the Vietnam War, he would work a couple of odd jobs, but none of these jobs ever lasted very long since he would usually do something to get himself fired. It is known that this family was extremely poor as their three daughters were growing up. It was to the point that they didn't have basic necessities. The girls were always dirty since they didn't have water to take showers. They were hungry all the time. It wasn't a safe environment for young children to grow up in at all. Marjorie herself described Larry as a pervert and a habitual cheater. She claims that sometimes when Larry thought no one was around, he would put on and wear her underwear as well as their daughter's underwear. The relationship between Marjorie and Larry was overall 
horrific and disturbing. Larry would often cheat on Marjorie with both men and women. They had this sort of open marriage, I guess you could say. Even though it was Larry who made those types of decisions, Marjorie had absolutely no say. Larry would take Marjorie out to random bars and he would claim to people drinking at these bars that he was someone who was wealthy or prominent, like a doctor, for example. He would introduce Marjorie as his girlfriend and he would pick up these random people at these bars, men, women, it didn't matter, and he would watch as he forced Marjorie to have sex with these people. He made her participate in these orgies several times, which made her feel disgusting and ashamed of herself, to the point where she would have multiple suicide attempts as her daughters grew up. After one instance when Melinda was nine years old, Larry watched as he had multiple men assault his wife, and afterwards Marjorie attempted to drown herself. After she survived the drowning attempt, she refused to let Larry touch her for several weeks. But since Larry, as I mentioned, was a disgusting piece of shit, he then violently raped Marjorie, allegedly with all three of their daughters watching this assault. In 1986, in another incident, Marjorie had refused to let Larry come home with two women he had picked up from a bar, and in retaliation, he beat Marjorie so severely that she had to be hospitalized, and he was convicted for battery. It seems that this abuse didn't just stop at his wife Marjorie. There are many claims he had abused many underage girls, including allegedly molesting Marjorie's younger sister, who was just 13 years old at the time of the abuse. There are court testimonies from a cousin of the Loveless family named Teddy, who claimed she had been molested by Larry from the ages of 10 to 14 years old. Both of Melinda's older sisters, Michelle and Melissa, also alleged that their father had molested them as they were growing up. Melinda herself has never admitted to any sexual abuse from her father, but during Teddy's testimony, according to court documents, she described an incident where there was one time when Larry had tied up all three of his daughters in the garage and raped them one by one. None of the sisters have confirmed this incident that supposedly occurred in the garage, but knowing about Larry's previous sexual and violent tendencies, it wouldn't surprise me if the alleged incident in the garage had happened. In November of 1990, Marjorie caught Larry spying on Melinda and a school friend of hers as they were undressing in her room. Once Marjorie realized what Larry was doing, she went into a fit of rage, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and attacked Larry. During the attack, he was able to grab the knife by the blade and disarm Marjorie, but after she was disarmed, she would again attempt to take her own life unsuccessfully. Larry was treated at the hospital for his injuries, and as soon as he was released, he filed for divorce from Marjorie and moved to Florida, which probably felt like such a relief for Marjorie after everything she had gone through during the relationship with him. Unfortunately, the years of constant abuse within this household had really affected Melinda. Even though her father was an evil predator, once he left instead of feeling relief, like most people would feel in this situation, Melinda was feeling heartbroken. She had developed such a blind loyalty towards her father. She wrote him letters constantly telling him how much she missed him and couldn't wait to visit and see him again. But with Larry being the asshole that he was, would very quickly stop replying to his daughter's letters, leaving her feeling abandoned and full of distrust toward people in general. These feelings of abandonment never left Melinda. Eventually, Marjorie would get married to Melinda's stepfather. And now with Marjorie having a stable career as a nurse and with her new stepfather's income, the family was now a lot more financially stable than they had ever been before. Her new stepfather tried to develop a relationship with Melinda, but her loyalty to her father remained and she would never let herself get attached to her new stepfather. In fact, she began to resent him as she felt like he was trying to take the place of her father. As a quick side note, after Larry's history came out during Melinda's trial for Shanda's murder, Larry was charged with three counts of rape, six counts of sodomy, and two counts of sexual battery. All of these charges were against children. But in June of 1995, a dumbass judge dropped all of the charges except one count of sexual battery due to the statute of limitations as all the crimes that were dropped had occurred in the early 80s. Larry did spend a little time in prison for the one account of sexual battery, but he was released pretty quickly. But karma would eventually get Larry, and I'm honestly pleased to report that this evil man was killed in a car crash in Missouri on December 16, 1998. 
Melinda met Amanda Heverin in early 1990. At first, her mother Marjorie just assumed the girls were really close friends until one day Marjorie saw her daughter with a bunch of hickeys that appeared on her neck after her and Amanda spent some time in her bedroom. Melinda then admitted to her mother that she and Amanda were more than friends. By this point, her two older sisters had already come out as lesbians as well, so her mother after a while accepted Melinda's sexuality just like her sisters. To Melinda, Amanda was her comfort. She made Melinda feel happy and it's widely believed that Melinda's attraction towards Amanda had a lot to do with her reminding Melinda of her father. Amanda gave Melinda the attention she craved, and she was, in my opinion, obsessed with Amanda. She was willing to do anything to keep this relationship with her. Once Larry was out of the picture, Melinda's behavior would decline instead of improve. She would get into trouble at school, she got into fights, she received attention often. She had to repeat her entire 8th grade year since her grades continuously suffered. The only thing that had become constant in her life was her relationship with Amanda, until Shanda entered the picture. This brings us back to the timeline of events. By the fall of 1991, Amanda and Melinda have had a pretty steady relationship for a little over a year. Amanda told Melinda about the physical fight she had had with Shanda Scherer and even told Melinda how she couldn't stand her. But after a couple of days in detention together, the entire attitude Amanda had felt about Shanda made a complete 180 turn. She now began telling her girlfriend how now she liked Shanda and how they managed to smooth things over and become friends while being in detention together. Amanda would start talking about Shanda a lot and would just casually bring her up in random conversations. Melinda wasn't blind, she was reading the signs that Amanda was openly displaying, and this is around the time Melinda began feeling massive amounts of jealousy towards Shanda Scherer. Amanda and Shanda became close very quickly. They would pass each other's notes throughout class, they were constantly together in the hallways, side by side, talking and giggling to each other. Melinda watched this as it went on, and she was infuriated at what she was seeing. She confronted Amanda one day and demanded to see the notes that they had been passing to each other. And when Amanda refused, Melinda blew up and demanded that she stay away from Shanda. This wasn't the first time Melinda would portray controlling behavior. She had done this before with Amanda. If she felt that Amanda was looking or getting too close to another girl, Melinda would instruct Amanda to not see that person anymore. As far as we know, Amanda would always listen to Melinda when she demanded her to stop contact with certain girls but that would change with Shanda. Amanda would begin to write letters to Shanda in secret, and they would start sending these very intimate letters back and forth with each other, starting around mid-September of 1991. Shanda would introduce Amanda to her family as a great friend of hers, and right away, Shanda's mother, Jackie, wasn't the biggest Amanda Heverin fan, mainly due to the physical fight that they had gotten into at the beginning of the school year. Shanda would stick up for Amanda and explain to her mother that she was her friend and she really enjoyed hanging out and spending time with her. Reluctantly, Jackie allowed Shanda to spend time with Amanda, which would later become a decision that Jackie herself says she would deeply regret. The main point of communication between Shanda and Amanda were these notes and letters they frequently wrote to each other. I would love to be able to scan each and every one of these letters to draw my own conclusions on what I think their full relationship really was. There's, I feel like, a lot of controversy about how Shanda was truly feeling about Amanda. It's very clear to me, at least, that Amanda was a lot more into Shanda than Shanda was to Amanda. At least Amanda was into her a lot more sexually than Shanda was. Which makes sense due to their age difference, which we will talk about in a minute. By the end of September, Amanda would tell Shanda in these notes how pretty she was and how much she really liked her and was attracted to her. As more days went by, the letters from Amanda to Shanda became more and more flirtatious with nonstop compliments. Amanda was constantly asking Shanda if she liked her back in the same way that she felt about her. As far as I know, we do not truly know how Shanda answered these types of questions that Amanda was asking her. Not all of the letters have been released to the public. And trust me, I've scoured for all these letters. By October, the letters would escalate even further. Amanda would tell Shanda in these letters how she wanted to make love to her and satisfy her every need. She would tell Shanda how hot and sexy she was and how much she wanted her. These were the types of letters that were being written by the now recently turned 15-year-old Amanda to the still 12-year-old Shanda Sharer. Clearly, the relationship was escalating and it was escalating very quickly. The three-year age gap is definitely quite disturbing when you really think about it. I don't know about you all, 
but I can honestly say that I may as well have been a completely different person when I think about myself at age 12 and then I think about myself at age 15. A 12 year old and a 15 year old are in completely different realms mentally and it's just weird picturing a 15 year old having these very strong romantic and sexual feelings towards a 12 year old. The relationship between Shanda and Amanda would become a sexual one. It is known that Shanda and Amanda had spent the night with each other at least once. During this night, the girls shared a sexual experience and based on a letter Amanda wrote to Shanda the very next day, it seems like Shanda may have had some mixed feelings about the experience. In this letter, Amanda told Shanda that she had an amazing night with her and how she couldn't wait to be intimate with her again and then proceeded to tell her not to cry about it anymore. We do know what Shanda's reply back to Amanda was. She told her that she also loved the night that they had spent together and how she also couldn't wait for more. It was very short and to the point. To me, this response from Shanda seemed more like her trying to make Amanda happy rather than her actually telling her her true emotions about their experience together. Shanda, remember, is a people pleaser. She never wanted to upset anyone, and I do believe she really did care about Amanda and didn't want to hurt her by telling her she didn't reciprocate the same feelings back. But this is a 12-year-old girl we are talking about, and it's hard thinking about a child at such a young age having these sexual experiences with someone who is three years older than her. Shanda was, again, in my opinion, based off all of these letters that are accessible, seems like she was conflicted about the experience, and she even confided to a friend at one point how she and Amanda had done things together. She explained to this friend that Amanda was telling her that they were lesbians and in this relationship together, but that she was also confused because sexually she was more attracted to boys than she had ever been attracted to Amanda. And while all of this was going on, Melinda was still watching their interactions together. And Amanda would constantly tell Melinda that Shanda and her were just good friends and to not worry about it. But as more and more time passed, it became obvious to Melinda that this was not the truth. Shanda was always around Amanda. The girls continued passing their notes and they would call each other all the time. And Amanda would always stare at Shanda as if she was the most beautiful person on the planet. There were just so many undeniable signs as much as Melinda wanted to believe in Amanda, she couldn't deny what her own eyes were seeing. Melinda eventually began making public threats to Shanda, telling her to stay away from her girlfriend or else. Melinda would also frequently confront Amanda about her feelings for Shanda, and sometimes Amanda would admit her feelings for Shanda to Melinda. But then she would also claim that she loved both Melinda and Shanda and couldn't help having feelings for both girls. Amanda clearly loved the fact that she had both of these beautiful girls. She had Shanda wrapped around her finger, manipulating Shanda into this relationship with her, and she had Melinda on the verge of exploding with jealousy and loving every minute of it. She was playing both of these girls' emotions, especially with Melinda who was telling Amanda over and over and over again to stay away from Shanda. But Amanda didn't take Melinda or her threats seriously and decided to make a bold ass move by inviting Shanda to be her date for a school dance at the same school all three girls attended. Now Amanda was told by Melinda that she wasn't going to go to this dance. Melinda was known to not like school dances. She thought they were lame and she had actually already made plans with another friend that night to drink alcohol and instead of going to the dance. Melinda began drinking as planned with this friend and after a few drinks, she broke down. She began crying, telling her friend how she was so jealous of Shanda and how she believed that Amanda was with Shanda at the school dance right at this very moment, even though Amanda specifically told her that she was not going with Shanda. In her inebriated state, she told this friend that she was sure that Shanda was stealing her girlfriend away from her. And she ended up convincing this friend to drive her all the way to the school dance to see if Amanda lied to her about not being with Shanda. Once they got to the school, they stayed in the car in the parking lot and waited for the dance to end and for the students to start heading home. Melinda spotted Amanda and Shanda together, of course, and she made a huge scene in the parking lot. She was yelling and screaming at both girls, and she slapped Amanda right across the face for this act of betrayal. After this confrontation, Melinda made several more threats about how she was going to kill Shanda Sharer. She even wrote letters about wanting to kill Shanda to Amanda, which Amanda just simply ignored and didn't take seriously. Around this time, Jackie had started to notice a change in her daughter's behavior. 
the once academic girl's grades were dropping and she no longer was interested in playing sports or really doing anything except being in her room with her door closed shut alone. One day while Shanda was spending the weekend with her father, Jackie had unintentionally intercepted a letter that Shanda had written to Amanda. Shanda wrote this letter and had forgotten to add a stamp to it before she put it in the mailbox. So this letter was returned to her mother's mailbox and she was very disturbed by what she had read. Shanda wrote about how much she missed Amanda and how she missed touching Amanda's body. Jackie immediately contacted Shanda's father, Stephen, to let him know what she had found. And she drove to Stephen's house and confronted Shanda about this letter. Shanda immediately broke down in tears and tried to deny this letter by telling Jackie that what she had written was all just a joke and wasn't serious. And Jackie knew this was a lie based on how her daughter was breaking down in tears in front of her. Jackie comforted Shanda as she was breaking down in her arms and she told her daughter that she loved her no matter what and that she didn't have to be ashamed. But she also told Shanda that she was still just a little girl and she shouldn't be having these experiences with anyone because she was so young still. After this revelation, Jackie and Steven made the decision to remove their daughter from Hazelwood Middle School and they transferred her to Our Lady of Perpetual Help School. At first, Shanda wasn't happy when she found out that she was being transferred to a new school again. But once she started her classes, Shanda once again started to thrive. Her grades skyrocketed back up, she was playing sports again, and she had joined the basketball team. Jackie and Steven were relieved to see that their daughter was coming back to her old sunshine self. Amanda, however, still was in the picture. She couldn't seem to just leave Shanda alone. She kept calling Shanda over and over again, trying to weasel her way back into her life. Jackie and Steven had intercepted quite a few of these calls and refused to let Amanda speak with their daughter. After a while, this Jackie physically went over to Amanda's house one day and told Amanda's father to keep his daughter away from Shanda and for her to stop calling them. For a while, Shanda was still in touch with Amanda, but the contact between them started to fade away as more time had passed. Eventually, Shanda no longer picked up Amanda's calls or responded to her letters anymore, and Amanda became desperate. She somehow managed to get in touch with one of Shanda's cousins, and her cousin was the one to inform Amanda that Shanda had moved on and she had made new friends, and she was actually dating a boy that she had met from being at this new school. Despite this, Amanda was still writing love notes to Shanda and wrote her name on her school folder. When Melinda saw that Amanda had written Shanda's name on this folder, she went into a fit of rage and screamed at Amanda for doing this. It broke Melinda's heart, the realization that Amanda was still constantly thinking about Shanda, even though Shanda wasn't even going to the same school with them anymore. It was now early December of 1991, and even though Shanda was now at a completely different school, and not even really on speaking terms with Amanda, Melinda could not get past the jealousy she had for Shanda Sharer. Melinda had started a relatively new friendship with 17-year-old Lori Tackett, who she had met through mutual friends in late November. Lori was born on October 5, 1974, and she lived with her parents and younger brother in Madison, Indiana. Lori allegedly claimed during her trial that she herself had been molested by a family member on two separate occasions, once when she was five and again when she was 12. But this has never been officially proven, nor do I honestly believe that this happened. And you'll soon understand why. Her mother was a devout fundamentalist Christian who maintained strict rules for the entire family. Lori wasn't allowed to wear makeup or jeans or any type of shorts as she was growing up. She was forced to wear long sleeve dresses that would cover up all of her skin. Lori's mother had also removed the TV from the family home and prohibited all music except for Christian church music to be played in the house. Due to the conservative way Lori was forced to dress, kids would begin to tease her at school. She was constantly made fun of for the way she dressed. Due to the constant bullying, Lori began to rebel her strict dress code and stole provocative clothing, which she would change into at school after her parents dropped her off. Now that she was wearing this clothing, the other kids began to pay more attention to her. She started to experiment sexually with multiple boys and girls at her school. In May of 1989, her mother had discovered that her daughter had changed into jeans at school one day, and in retaliation, allegedly later that night, after Lori came home, her mother attempted to strangle her. Child Protective Services was called about this incident, and Lori's parents agreed to unannounced visits from CPS workers to ensure that there was no abuse occurring in the household. 
no further incident had ever been reported after this. From a very young age, Lori had been revolted by the traditional Christianity religion. She did not believe in God, and she also felt like the Christian religion judged her for who she was as a person. So Lori became obsessively interested in the occult by the time she turned 15 years old. And we've talked about this before in other cases, like in the Shrout family murder case, the teenage son who murdered his entire family, he was obsessed with the occult as well. And I'm not saying that anyone who is obsessed with the occult is gonna end up murdering people. I'm just saying it's kind of a red flag when you're a teenager and you become unhealthily obsessed with the occult. By the time Lori was 15 years old, she began cutting her hair short and dyeing it in all sorts of different colors. She dressed in nothing but black provocative outfits, dark makeup, the whole getup. She also started dabbling in magic, trying to cast spells on people that judged her or made her feel inferior. She continued to be bullied for her now more gothic appearance and she began to self-harm herself in various ways by cutting or burning herself. Lori did some pretty extensive self-mutilation to herself. She would cut herself in the wrist deep enough so she could collect the blood and she would use the blood from the wound to paint pictures which she would call blood art. She would also attempt to impress her friends who were also interested in the occult, and she would constantly tell them how she was possessed by a vampire spirit by the name of Deanna, which no one ever took her seriously about. On March 19th, 1991, Lori had went too far with her self-harm and ended up being hospitalized. She was then transferred to a psychiatric ward where she proceeded to tell the doctors that she had been experiencing hallucinations since she was very young. It was here that doctors diagnosed Lori with borderline personality disorder, and she was given medication for depression. Lori was discharged from the psychiatric unit on April 12, 1991. By September of the same year, Lori had dropped out of high school altogether. In October of 1991, she began staying with various friends, some of which lived in New Albany, Indiana. It is from these mutual friends where Lori met Melinda. Lori would use heavy drugs with her occult friends. They would have sex with each other and party throughout all hours of the night. But this party life didn't last too long as these teenagers eventually ran out of money after spending all the money on drugs and liquor. Without any money left, Lori was forced to seek shelter back with her parents in Madison. Her parents agreed to let their daughter come back and live with them with the condition that she would find a job and contribute to society like a normal human being. Lori agreed to these terms and her parents purchased her a car so she could have transportation to and from her job at Walmart that she was able to get. Lori used this car to travel from Madison to New Albany and to Louisville whenever she had free time to see various friends. Lori is a character to say the least, right? Even her occult friends felt like she was just way out there in delusional land. She made up these stories of herself having creepy visions of death and corpses and started making up different entities that were possessing her all the time. And after a while, these stories got very old and annoying and a lot of her friends started to not even want to hang out with her anymore because they were just tired of hearing all the crap that she made up. So she sought companionship in Melinda, who although felt the same about Lori overall being weird and a disturbing human being. Lori would talk about death and murder a lot in general, and Melinda also had her own evil thoughts about wanting to murder Shanda Sheriff for taking Amanda away from her. Lori and Melinda started having very detailed conversations about murder. They talked about how they would do it. They talked about how they were curious about what it felt like to take away someone's life. Melinda could tell that Lori would be willing to commit murder with her, and now these two teenage girls were becoming the perfect duo to carry out the murder that Melinda wanted so desperately to happen. Through Lori, they recruited two more girls for their murder plan, both 15-year-olds. Their names are Hope Rippey and Tony Lawrence, the last two monsters of this case. Hope Rippey was born on June 9th, 1976 in Madison, Indiana. Hope, Tony, and Lori had known each other from a very young age since elementary school. Hope's parents divorced when she was just about seven years old in February of 1984. During this divorce, the family had split up for about three years. Hope's father and older brothers had remained in the Madison home, while Hope, her mother, and younger sibling had moved to Michigan. Hope remained in Michigan until her parents decided to get back together in 1987, where then they all moved back to Madison. The Rippey family kept fighting a lot, even after reuniting together. Since Hope had moved back to Madison and was hanging out with her past friends Lori and Tony, she started to get influenced by them. She started to smoke, drink, and self-harm. She started to have multiple sexual partners by the time she hit high school, much like her longtime friend Lori. 
Hope's parents did not approve of the friendship she had with Lori. They were well aware what a bad influence Lori was, so they encouraged Hope to spend time with other friends, which included Tony. But this never really stopped Hope from spending time with Lori. She would just tell them that she was hanging out with Tony and then all three of the girls would hang out together. Tony Lawrence was born in February of 1976, also in Madison, Indiana. She lived with her parents and two older sisters. She and Hope had met in kindergarten and had remained close friends ever since, especially since they only lived a few blocks away from each other. Tony, from a very young age, was described as a quiet and reserved student. She was well liked at school. She didn't have issues with people in general until something horrific happened to her. In 1991, after Tony had just turned 14 years old, she was at a friend's house hanging out with several other teens when one of the boys at this house forced Tony into one of the bedrooms and raped her. This sexual assault was, of course, very traumatic for her. And Madison is a relatively small area, so the kids at her school quickly found out about the encounter, and instead of them taking Tony's side and trying to help her through her sexual assault, they apparently took the side of the boy who had raped her, and they started to turn on Tony. Tony quickly became depressed. Her grades plummeted. She no longer wanted to even go to school. She became promiscuous and also began to self-harm like the other girls. So now we have four young, disturbed girls coming together, all having their own traumatic experiences and issues, and it would prove to be a horrifying, tragic disaster for all four of these girls to come together. Melinda and Lori concocted a plan for the night of January 10th, 1992, a sick, twisted plan to abduct Shanda, to beat her, and to take her life. If these four teens had never met each other, I guarantee that Shanda Shara would still be alive today. But here's where I will stop part one. For part two, we are going to finish up this case and we will start part two with the night of Shanda's murder and all of the brutal and horrifying events that went down on the night of January 10th and morning of January 11th, 1992. Part two is going to be longer than this video as we still have a lot to go over in order to conclude this case. If you're still with me, thank you so much for watching and listening to this video. Like I said, this case means a lot to me. I'm very proud to be able to share Shanda's story. I hope wherever she is, she has the peace that she deserves. I hope her family has found any type of peace that's possible given this situation. My heart will always be broken for them. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button to support the channel. Comment down below and let me know what you think about this case. I am recording the audio for part one and two of this case back to back, so part two will be uploaded within the next couple of days. And if you don't want to miss part two, hit the notification bell. And remember to stay safe, True Crimers, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye, guys.